I'm Amy Morgan, the feature writer for the Marriage Initiative. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Richard Marks. Dr. Marks is nationally recognized for his work on relationship and emotional wellness. With more than 30 years of experience helping couples and individuals achieve healthy, connected relationships, often he helps deeply troubled couples as they wrestle with how trauma, substance abuse, sexual addiction, and general mental health issues affect their marriages. Dr. Marks earned a PhD in counseling psychology and a master's degree in marriage and family therapy. He also earned another master's degree in religious education from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And all this after he served in the U.S. Navy as a chaplain's assistant. Dr. Marks was a licensed professional counselor for 31 years and remains a clinical fellow with the AAMFT. He's a member of a number of prestigious counseling associations and has spoken at many national conferences. Dr. Mark served on the Florida Commission on Marriage and Family Support Initiatives, served Governor Brownback of Kansas in starting the statewide Fatherhood and Marriage Initiatives, and founded nonprofit Marriage for Life in Jacksonville, Florida, to run the area's community marriage initiative. Prior to that, he was a family pastor at Jacksonville's First Baptist Church and a professor at Regent University in the Counseling School. He worked with mentor Dr. Lori Gordon to create a Christian version of the classic relationship model pairs. In addition to several ebooks, Dr. Marks published Relationships for Life, How to Improve Yourself and the Relationships Around You in 2011. His Relate Well relationship program helps people become healthy, mature adults so they can love maturely. Dr. Marks, thank you so much for being here. All that means is I am an overachiever. Have you thought of it that way? I was going to say, that. you I have all that. I go, the guy was insecure and he had a lot of issues, so he became an overachiever. Listen, it is really good to be here. Thanks, oh. for, thanks for, the, uh, for the opportunity, Amy. Oh, well, you know, I just hit the highlights. You have a resume as long as your arm. Um, tell us, though, like you said, you, you've done a lot, but tell us how you got started. What motivated you to even get into this field of helping couples and, and being a counselor and a pastor? <laughs> You know, the, the simple answer is, it wasn't my academic background. The, the simple answer is that I was born in 1961 to my, my biological mom and dad. They divorced after five years of marriage. There were four kids at the time they divorced. Um, men had four children in four years, you know. And my mom was having right out a year um, in a row, right after they got married. And we were put in my father's custody, and he was... He, uh, I was raised by my biological, my, I was not raised by my biological mother. I actually had to, I had to hate her. I was, had to call her Mrs. Como growing up. So what we go now call parental alienation syndrome. Back in the 1670s, nobody thought about what that was doing to children. Um, my dad was my idol. And so I did what he said. And I would do anything that he said. I was pretty heavily enmeshed with him back in my childhood days. And, um, but my dad had an anger issue. And I, around, I was around 10 or 11 bought a cow prod. And used to shock us. So I would say that a lot of the reason I do what I do today is because I grew up in dysfunction and abuse and craziness with their addictions in the home. And when I left home at age 18 and joined the Navy, uh, I made a decision after I got married in 84 to Luella. I was not I was not going to pass on a generational curse of addictions and brokenness, but I wasn't healthy, mature. And so I had to grow up as an adult. So I could be, have a healthy, strong marriage, what I call us. So we can have it be a strong us. And so I could raise my kids to be mature adults. So a lot of it is because my wife and I grew up in brokenness and we decided we're not doing this anymore. I don't really see myself as anything special. It's just somebody who said, you know what? I'm not living this way. I'm not passing on a generational curse. I get that the sins of the fathers will visit the third, fourth generation. But I always tell people, keep on reading. It goes on to say that the generation that follows my commands, I'll bless a thousand generations. Well, we're not slaves to what was. We can create today what can be. And my wife and I went and did that. And we found mentors and teachers, particularly me. And I said, all right, I'm changing me. And I did. And now you've taken what you learned and you, you know, you didn't just learn a, a marriage class here and there. You, you undertook some serious study to become um, very well versed and kind of Even created your yeah, even postgraduate work, because I, I am trained and certified in most of the leading relationship skills curriculums that are out there. 
Um, and and so the better curriculums are actually, I'd say it, they're in the secular world. They're actually created by Christian people, but they don't market to the church. They market to the culture. Um, yet I, I sat under Dr. Lori Gordon, Michelle Wiener Davis, uh, Dr. John Van App. I, I, I was teaching his program in 98 uh, when he first kind of launching himself through smart marriages. I purchased the program and started teaching it and adapted it. So I've taught all of them, but relate well is a big, over the years, my curriculum morphed into what is now relate well, which is really all the things I learned that God taught me through my different teachers and mentors and my own thinking, which now teaches really the fundamentals for how to, how to bond, how to emotionally regulate, how to connect, how the brain works for attachment. Or I like to say it simply, we teach you how to be angry and not sin. We teach you how to be slow to anger, quick to hear and slow to speak. Uh, we teach you how to mourn with those that mourn and to rejoice with those that rejoice. We actually teach you how to do all those Bible verses. Well, and let's talk about what's in Relate Well for our marriage champions. So they can, let's unpack it a little bit further and then we'll talk about how they can apply it. Okay. So um, in my transformation, you know, when A94 is when it really took off, when I cared enough to change. We say in our world, when you care enough, you'll change, but not until. Yeah. Uh, it was in 94 that I cared enough to change. And um, so in, in my own transformation, four words kept showing up in my spirit on how to regulate myself, Amy. And, and again, a lot of this did not come from my academic training. It was what I believe God was teaching me that I needed to become different. I needed to transform into being these words, not knowing these words. And so uh, I call them today H-reg, H equals R-E-G. And so the four words that I began to, to regulate myself by, which have now become a core value for me, is am I living with humility? Am I being respectful? Am I being empathic, which is really am I being caring? And am I treating people with goodwill? And I've come to learn that love always, always, always treats people with respect and goodwill. It never sends a message, I don't care. And love can only truly operate through humility. And so HREG is my core value system. I begin to monitor myself. Am I being humble right now? Am I being respectful, empathic, and goodwill? And I knew if I was being those things in a moment, then I knew for a fact that I was being loving. So um, I operationalized the word love is HREG, humility, respect, empathy, goodwill. So that's the core value system of what the individuals in a marriage need to become. But let's take it outside of the marriage. That's what we're supposed to become as Christians. I truly believe the heart of the gospel message, if we are living it out in the heart, not just the mind, then you become a humble person, respectful, empathic, and goodwill. Because love always treats people that way. That's what Jesus was. And the second value system was, is like Lord taught me, now this is back when I was a professor at Regent University. Um, I was studying all these people's definitions of one flesh and take what I'm about to say with goodwill. I am not saying the definitions that people have for one flesh are, are not good definitions. It's their definitions. I get it. But when I was a professor at Regent, I was studying definitions of one flesh. And part of it, I was trying to figure out my own life and marriage as well. The definitions that I was reading didn't seem sufficient to me. It was like something was missing. And then I realized both Paul and Jesus admit the idea of one flesh is a mystery. Well, if, if it's mysterious on some level, you can't clearly define something that actually is on some level mysterious, right? right. The mystery is somewhat undefinable. So back in those days, I remember I was sitting in my office there at the, at the university and I, and I was kind of in a prayer mood. And I said, well, God, if you can't define this thing called one flesh, how would I know if I had a one flesh marriage? And the answer I received from spirit turned my life around from that day, even to this day. And the answer I got was this. It's simple. You feel it. I don't want you to feel it. And I, you do feel it. And so we say this way now, you always know when us is in the house. Why? You feel it. When us is in the house, you feel the love, you feel the warmth, you feel the tenderness, you feel the connection, you feel the bond. And so do your children. Mm. Everybody knows when us is in the house. You feel its presence. You also know when it's 
not in the house. You feel that too. Because you can feel the angst, the tension, the resentment, the bitterness, the yeah. coldness, the silence. You can feel that. And so do your children. Mm-hmm. So I always tell couples, you want three people in your bedroom at the end of every, every, every night, you, her, and us. And, and when us is in the bedroom, you sleep well. Yeah. You know? When us is not in the bedroom, you probably don't. Because you know, it's going like, you know, you, you sleep back to back. You know, get your feet off me, that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, you sleep in another room. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be a mature Christian and I'm going to live this way? No, I'm not doing that. To myself, to Luella, to us, or to my children. And so I began to realize that humility is the path to living for us. And if I want to sustain us, I must stay humble, but I must treat Luella in a respectful way, with empathy, and everything I do must be goodwill towards her. If you sow discord, you're going to reap discord. Yeah. So- well, I love how you operationalize, like you said, love. Because I would expect, as you've been working with people who you know have dealt with you know trauma and addiction and failure to bond, they might not really understand what love really means or looks like. But if you can I break didn't. it down to right, and if you can break it down to it means you know, humility, uh, empathy, goodwill. Okay. Those are words I can do. Yes. And then we'll show love. Yes. And then if you, and here's the key, uh, and let me kind of give a parallel. I always ask the question, does God have love? And people say, yes. I say, no, he doesn't. That's not what the scripture says. It says God is love. And because God doesn't have love, he is love. No matter what he does, it is loving. Because you can have love, but not be love, not be love, right? Yeah. And what Father taught me was, Rick, you must transform yourself not to have humility, to become humility. You must transform yourself to not have respect, but to be respect, to be empathy, and to be goodwill. Not perfectly, but maturely. Which is all about emotional wellness, emotional intelligence is the term in the corporate world. And so I had to position myself for transformation to become a reg as a way of being is a phrase that we always use, which is the, what my mentor, Lori Gordon, always said. It's a way of being, Rick. You have a way of being. Change your way of being and you'll change Luella. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I never thought about that. You know, I always say we train our partners to be who they are around us because of how we are as a way of being. You know, Dr. Phil says it's simpler. On his TV show, he always says you teach people how to be around you. And, and he's absolutely right. I just heard it differently from Lori before all that. And so I transform my life into becoming a reg as maturely as I can so that no matter what I do, I'm loving. And, and when that's it, what you teach in your Relate Well curriculum, correct? Yes. It's the yes. core value of Relate Well is the idea that us is most important. And if you want to preserve us, you as an individual must become humble, respectful, and mathic and goodwill. And how can a marriage champion who thinks, aha, this sounds really interesting. This sounds like what my small group needs. It sounds like what my husband and I need. How could a marriage champion access that? You have uh, weekend uh, retreats. You t- talk about how they could get well, a hold of that. One way is relatewell.us. Um, is we have a co- the core curriculum, which is a nine-session curriculum. And basically... Chapters one and two. Chapter one is about the value system of HREG and us. Chapter two is how the brain bonds through 10 relational needs. And then the other chapters are basically built around humility, respect, empathy, and goodwill. What are the skills for humility? What are the skills for empathy? What are the skills for goodwill? And what are the skills for respect? Respect of the communication ones because you communicate with respect or you communicate disrespectfully. So we have research-based uh, uh, skills like many programs do. Ours are no different. Um, on how to communicate an issue with humility, respect, and goodwill. All right. We teach you brain regulation, emotional regulation of the brain. So we talk about the, you know, how the brain functions and bonding, but also how to stay out of the lower order brain and stay to the higher brain where you can have empathy, you can be respectful, and you can treat people with goodwill. Um, so we, we, it teaches the, all of this, all of that in nine sessions. So it's a nine session curriculum. And you can go to relatewell.us. There's a, the first link is called core. That's the core curriculum for youth, singles, and or married people. Anybody can learn it. 
because it's not a marriage curriculum. It's adapted to marriage mostly, but a dating couple can learn it. All right. Then there are the links called clinical. And the clinical program is where I teach a video training, where I teach pastoral counselors. You, a marriage mentor could watch it. Therapists, psychologists can watch it. How to use the curriculum as a counseling tool, mm. as a mentoring tool, which more and more churches are using it for mentoring as well. Yeah. Um, and, and so those are two places you can go. Um, here locally, we do some Relate Well trainings. Um, we actually do classes teaching people, you know, couples the, the work. If someone wanted to stat, learn it and how to use it, I would just tell them go to the clinical link at relatewell.us and purchase it that way. If you're a licensed counselor, National Marriage Seminars offers CEUs for it because yeah. they're a strong endorser of it. Well, and that is so important. So they could figure out how to use it, you know, to enrich. And I know you develop that too because you do a lot of personal counseling and with some of the really hardest things addiction i know you talked a lot about um uh loneliness and attachment and failure to bond and depression let's let's talk about that what what have you found and how do you, how do you help with those things because those are really hard issues that's that's more than just we're not communicating respectfully that's those are some big things Dr. Cassiopo's work and many others like him who've researched loneliness um, have actually shown scientifically, and I believe this work to be true, um, most depression, uh, loneliness does, depression does not cause loneliness. Loneliness causes depression. Matter of fact, the leading health epidemic that Cigna tracks, I think it's every other year, they've been tracking for a little over 10 years now. The leading health epidemic in America right now is loneliness, not COVID. That's an urgent crisis. Loneliness has been destroying this country for, for over 10 years. It, it got so bad about nine to 10 years ago, health insurance companies contracted a health company called Tivity Health out of Nashville. They wanted them to stop, to stop fix this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, this health problem that they want fixed increases heart attacks, strokes, early death, it, it leads to addictions, it leads to depression, it leads to all kinds of other biological problems, headaches, it leads to abdominal problems, mm -hmm. um, depression. All of that's linked to this one epidemic problem. And guess what it is? It's loneliness. Yeah. Humans were not created to live life alone. Even in the garden uh, where God says to Adam or says of Adam, it is not good that the man should be alone. If you think about it, Amy, Adam wasn't alone. He was actually in the garden with God. And the Hebrew language makes it clear that God showed up in human form in the garden when he was with Adam. Mm -hmm. So God said Adam was alone, but in reality, he wasn't alone because he's with God. So it begs the question, well, then how can you be with God in perfection and alone? People say that that verse is about marriage. It isn't. Here's how I know for a fact. You can be married and very much alone. And you can be single and not alone. We are now realizing that passage has to do with how God designed humans relationally. We were intended by God to not need him only. We are intended to need him and others. Think great commandment, love God and your others as yourself. And it's when humans bond in those three areas, bond to God, others, and self, at an emotional level, it has to be an emotional level as well, the right side of the brain, the limbic system, then we will thrive. If you don't bond in those areas, then you're in pain and pain moves you away from relationship into aloneness. And so addictions are now being rethought of. And I'm in that camp. I spoke a few weeks ago at Florida State University uh, for what a generational trauma conference on addictions as as an attachment disorder. You know, um, we're now looking at looking at issues now through the prism of attachment, the lack of bonding. And we now know medically, because the research journals are clear, the more lonely you are, the greater risk you are for all these physical problems, even early death. Maybe God knew something when he created us that we were actually created to thrive in relationship. And where's the best place to do that? Marriage and family. But when marriage and families break, fall, break down and you don't learn how to bond or connect there, which I never did, I left home at age 18, joined the Navy, I had no emotional attachments to anybody in my family, no parents, none. 
And I didn't realize just how alone I was. You feel it as a kid, but you don't have a language for it, right? Right. But you don't realize the pain that it causes and the things that we do to medicate the feeling of lone, of loneliness. And so people will try and go get those relational needs met in unhealthy ways, or they medicate it, i.e. addictions. So Relate Well was designed to teach people how to bond and how to connect, how to take the risk. And we do, we do, um, when you talk about regular counseling, a lot of what I do are one-on-one -on -one intensives mm -hmm. where we take couples in high distress and for three days, we get them out of divorce court and reconnected. And even if they have an addiction or those kind of things, learning about bonding and attachment and learning how to think of it this way, a quarter three strands not easy broken, right? right. We, were, we were created for connection. And here's what I've learned in my own personal journey. When Luella and I are our strongest, I feel like I can take on the world. It's just really that simple. And when we're not as connected, you feel the disconnection, you feel the break. It's harder to take on the world. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Relate Well helps people how, how to have healthy, thriving relationships in any relationship. So that you are a source of pleasure to people, not a source of pain just by how you treat them day in and day out so that you always open up opportunities that you are a source of love. You're a source of pleasure. So people will want to draw close to you. So you can speak into their hearts. You can speak into their life because you've earned the right. Cause the way they know you is someone who's loving and caring and that's how they'll trust you to be. Well, and I love too, how, of course, for our marriage champions, how it's so important in marriage to have those skills and to learn. But even backing up, like you said, with engaged couples or couples before engaged, but even, you know, like you, you grew up as a child. Yeah. Attachments. I bet our churches are full of children. You know, maybe you have a foster ministry in your church. Maybe you have, you know, they're full of people who on the inside have a bonding void. And by by knowing, being able to recognize and be able to offer this relate well curriculum and these skills, you could really head off some of these problems at, at the past, right? You could. I would say it this way too, Amy. You have so many, you have so many adults who are deeply alone and disconnected. Yeah. Not the kids, the adults are. And because the adults are so disconnected and, and unhealthy and immature, um, they can't raise mature kids. The reason my dad could not raise us to be healthy, mature adults, because he wasn't one. You can't give what you don't have. Mm -hmm. And so in chapter one of Relay, well, we actually identify what is an emotional infant, what is an emotional child, what is an emotional adolescent, and what does a mature adult look like? Mm -hmm. And people actually rate themselves. And most people go, I'm an adolescent, I'm a child. Yeah. I go, yeah. And that's why you can't have the marriage you want you don't know how to how to, you don't know how to emotionally regulate maturely to resolve conflict in a way that us wins. You guys are in your force a lot. You're in competition. Marriage is not a place for competition. It's a place for cooperation. You see, and so we teach people how to emotionally get there, the skills to do that. Now, again, you can teach somebody the skills, but they gotta want it enough to want to transform it into a way of being. I did. I was not, I was not going to be that guy hurting his wife anymore. I was going to be a different person. And that was my motive the whole time. Well, and you talk about that, that, about you have to reach a point of pain until it's worth it to you. Yeah. To want to change. Yeah. You know, when, when someone is taking a risk to give you their heart, you have to earn the right to hold that heart. Because if you don't, they're going to take it back from you. Mm. Matter of fact, um, it took me about two months to write this. Actually, I brought it just in case. I want to share it. I want you to think about when, when, whenever someone takes the risk to give their heart to somebody, right? Um, there's an unconscious declaration being made. We don't ever say it, but it's really true. And it took me about two months to articulate what that unconscious declaration is. And, and I have a, I produced a card here that I use on my marriage seminars. It's called I'm giving my heart, but on the back is the declaration. If it's okay, can I read it? Oh, please. This is what I came up with. 
whenever you give your heart to someone, this is unconsciously what you're actually saying to them. I'm giving you my heart. I choose to trust you with it. I place it in your hands to care for. I give it to you to encourage, nurture, support, lovingly speak into, protect and to pursue. Please do not neglect, invalidate, tear down, stomp on, beat up, squash, or break my heart. Mm -hmm. If you treat my heart with humility, respect, goodwill, and empathy, I can always keep it placed in your hands. I never want to have taken my heart back and protect it from you. Please do not put me in a position to have to protect my heart and thus myself from you. I love you and I place my heart in your hands. I do this freely of my own accord. That almost sounds like marriage vows. I'm starting because I'm an ordained minister as well. I'm starting to use it in, in weddings because everything I do moment by moment will tell Luella whether I'm a safe person to keep her heart in or does she have to take her heart back from me? And once you treat someone in a way on a regular basis that convinces them that you can't have their heart, it'd be very difficult for them to want to trust you again. And then they're coming to see you on a one-on-one -on -one three day intensive. And we show them how to get there. We just tell them, take a risk, take a risk. Let's see what happens. Can't change what was, we can change what is and what can be. And so our work is more of a coaching model than a traditional therapy model. I've, for the most part, I've left a traditional therapy model and working with couples after all these years. I have found from my mentors and my own experience that a coaching model works a lot better. That's more forward thinking and uh, with skills and, and how to get moving the other in a new direction. Yeah, it's, it's like Dr. Gordon said to me, you know, so long ago. And of course, you know, Lori Gordon, her work was international. I mean, Virginia Satir was a close friend of hers. She walked in those circles. She died about five years ago, six years ago, age 96. So the, Virginia Satir was the first um, president of her foundation, of Dr. Gordon's foundation. Wow. And so there's a strong connection and influence there. But Lori said to me once, you know, after a couple comes in and you've been trained to be a marriage training therapist and a psychologist, but after a couple comes in for an hour and they are stirring up energy, it's stirred up anyways, and they go home waiting for the next appointment, she said, Rick, what are they doing different? And I went, uh, nothing. She said, well, then you're not helping them, are you? And I went, you're right. But therapists aren't trained to teach people what to do. We're trained to interpret and give insight into why they do what they do. Mm. But if they don't have, they don't know how to, they don't know how to be angry and not sin. They don't know how to be slow to anger. They have to learn those skills. I had to learn those skills. Sadly, I had to learn them as an adult. I raised my kids and everything that I teach them relate well, because I wanted them to have those skills and tools before they became an adult. I wanted them to be able to use those skills and tools and fall back on them because it was a part of who they were. And so that's why my wife and I, we taught our kids what we were learning all along so that as we transform, we could impart into them what we never got from our parents. I think that's one of those blessings that goes to a thousand generations for those who it, it is amy that's what i tell everybody you're not stuck on the past you you can change the future but you got to change what you do today in this moment in this moment this moment because each moment is a move into the future anyways right and so each moment that i stop doing this and start doing that i'm changing the future and you leave a blessing of a legacy for, for your children and your children's children and, and your children's children, children. So. Yeah. I mean, I always jokingly say, if you look at my genogram and you go back about, you know, two, three generations, you see this function. So one day I want my grandkids to be at a, at a or late well class or some other class and they draw a genogram and they see health, health, health. Like, oh, now this is, this was my great granddad, Richard and uh, his, his wife, my great grandma, Luella. If you go behind them, it's like really messed up. But these two right here, they did something different and passed it down differently. You they know? said, you shall not 
pass like Gandalf is yes. to the ball warg and he goes down and you create a whole different trajectory. And that is so hopeful, Dr. Marks. I think that gives our marriage champions hope for themselves, for all the people, the couples in their churches that they're burdened for, the, the counselors and the coaches that are watching who think, wow, you've really inspired how, how we can make a difference. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing your insights. And I loved your call. That was, could you hold it up one more time? It was so beautiful so people can see it. Oh, there it is. It's just, I give you my heart. And on the back is the actual statement. And I have couples read it. As a matter of fact, funny story is I, you know, those little um, stress balls. Mm -hmm. I ordered um, the heart shaped ones yeah. and I had to put the relatable logo on. I ordered 500 and they never showed. And I kept, kind of, I need these things. Well, they said it was delivered. I'm telling you, it may say delivered. It wasn't. Well, it turned out they had to send me another 500. Three months later, a neighbor of mine on the next block, who was gone for two and a half months, came home, found this box on there. <laughs> well, got it with me. Now I've got a thousand of those things. <laughs> well, wow. that's okay. I I give them out, and I have even in my classes, I hand everybody a heart. So I want you to pass your heart to your spouse, and I want you to make this declaration. I love it. What what a great foundation. What a great legacy to pass on. Dr. Marks, thank you so much for being with us. You really have shared some greatly valuable information. Well, thank you for this opportunity and richest blessings to all of you. Oh, and marriage champions, as always, if you'd like to find out more about Richard Marks and Relate Well, you can find us at marriageinitiative.org.